Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. You know, a lot of people go on Ancestry.com. They look at their family tree, their family genealogy. Uh, they find that fascinating. Uh, I, for one, find my spiritual genealogy most fascinating. And I would hope that you would too. I want to give us a brief history of the church. I want to do this for several reasons. One of the reasons is it kind of puts it into perspective just where we're at today. I also believe that very strongly that in doing so we get a really good idea of where we are prophetically and uh, it's just other than that it's just plain interesting. Uh, we had a beginning. Uh, if you're a, a believer in uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, you have a history. You owe your present existence to what happened uh, in the past. And so I want to look at that, and I want to begin with the first century. I want to try to, I may not cover every century, but I want to briefly give you an overview to kind of put that into perspective and take that from the first century all the way up to the present. And then I want to talk a little bit afterwards, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, at least perhaps touch on the, on the subject of how uh, we as believers in Christ uh, minister to another believer, another Christian, uh, who's living under the law, uh, not grace. So, and I think it's all tied together, so. Uh, you can make up your own mind and about that. but So let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, so thankful for the understanding that you've given us, the opportunity that you've given us to study your word together. May the Holy Spirit direct this hour, just filtering out all of the foolishness, all of the ignorance, sealing to our hearts that which is truth, that we may grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. In the first century, the church uh, seemed to center on the theme of grace. This is how it started. It's not so much true today, unfortunately. But this is how the church started. The emphasis was, uh, at that time, was on a personal relationship with God, learned through the teaching of the apostles. Churches met in small numbers in, in the homes of believers. Uh, they were eager to share with each other the glory of the resurrection of Christ and a, and a new resurrected life for believers. Uh, the humanity and the deity of Jesus uh, was taught. Sunday was celebrated as Resurrection Day when the people rejoiced uh, over their new life and their hope by coming together to encourage one another. Uh, must have been a fantastic time to be alive. Uh, there were uh, regular gatherings, not just on Sundays, uh, for praise, instruction, and prayer. Uh, the canon of Scripture was determined by prophetic or apostolic origin. The church services often consisted of simply reading the Bible uh, for as long as the time permitted. Sometimes there was a small amount of discourse added, but uh, and that was in an attempt to urge the believers to imitate what the, they had heard. Songs were sometimes a part of worship and sharing, and this took place in the first century when the church was fresh and new. It should not surprise any of us that right away, right from the very beginning, uh, legalism crept into the church to try to corrupt that theme of grace. And the most amazing thing to me about that is, is that we see the same thing today. Now in the second century, uh, church. Uh, water baptism became an instrument of unity. Uh, we're studying through uh, the, the book of Acts in our Sunday uh, uh, 
videos were going through this uh, as a survey uh, quickly. We're in the 16th chapter, and uh, I pointed out how the baptism was, uh, water baptism was meant for the Jews. Uh, anytime you, you see the word water there, the word water, if the Holy Spirit added the word water, any place where you see baptism, he's probably referring to water. If you didn't, if you don't see the word water, it's probably a spiritual baptism. But baptism became an instrument of unity. It was right away from the very beginning, baptism was, went off track. Uh, it is not a requirement for redemption as uh, some denominations today suggest. Church membership was used to identify the members of a uh, local assembly. Uh, there was a demand for right lifestyles. Okay, as if, uh, as if Christ, the fulfillment of the law, did not come and, and you know, the grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. It was the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. But we're going to quickly go back to law and we're going to try to regulate or legislate morality uh, through the law. And, and that is not the theme of Scripture at all. Uh, there were regular assemblies on Sundays for prayer, praise, reading the Scriptures, preaching, prophesying, and celebrating the Lord's Supper. There was an expectation of a separation from uh, public and secular life. There, the emphasis was on discipline in the second century. Uh, law permeated the second century church. It did not the first century church. And so we're off to on the wrong foot, as they would say. And that became progressively worse uh, as the centuries unfolded. Churches were autonomous, uh, uh, each one with, with pastors and deacons, and, and they didn't appeal to government. Uh, from 130 to 180, from about 130 to 180 A.D., the uh, Christians began their practice of defending the faith, apologetics. They had to defend that faith. Uh, uh, the Gnostics, uh, those who believed that, uh, uh, well, without going in, launching into a no, deep and heavy discourse on Gnosticism, uh, they began their, their claim to a greater and deeper level of knowledge available only to a choice few. Uh, in 139 A.D., uh, it was theorized that there were actually two gods. There was a God of wrath in the Old Testament. There was a God of love in the New Testament. Uh, there was a, a, a longing for, a looking for, and insisting upon there, there being new prophecy. Uh, around 150 A.D., there, there began an extensive uh, baptismal confession, which later car would carried over into the Catholic Church at Rome, along with other various rituals and sacraments. Uh, and by 150 AD, there were various attempts to establish the uh, true New Testament canon of scriptures. There was also a movement which allowed no marriages, no marriages, and demanded complete separation from the world upon conversion. I guess, you know, they thought we had to just become instantly, you know, Christ-like. And that according to our own efforts. Looking ahead now to the third century, the third century brought uh, uh, many other uh, various opinions on the duality or the trinity of the Godhead. Some preached the means of forgiveness through prayer. Some considered certain grave sins to be, well, worth, uh, you know, excommunicating uh, those uh, over that. Uh, uh, a second so-called repentance. Uh, and in that period, some of the pastors began getting involved in the affairs of their communities. 
In 215 AD, Clement of Alexandria developed his theory of how God enlightens man. And in 230 AD, Origen preached the importance of prayer and Bible study. Uh, he saw God as creator, but, but not as an existing being. A lot of heresy crept in in the second century. There, there developed a system of clergy, including clerical workers and laity. It was in this century that the first church buildings were built, uh, buildings for the specific purpose of, of housing church meetings rather than meeting in the homes, as they did in the first century. There was considerable organization of the various churches above the local level. In many churches, the Lord's Supper was conducted every Sunday. Uh, they started practicing uh, uh, or conducting a baptism service once a year. This was a big deal. It was a big event. It was only an annual event, so very much a lot was made of it. And it called for fasting on the part of the baptismal candidates all day Friday and Saturday. Then at first light on Sunday morning, those candidates were stripped. Uh, they renounced Satan. They were anointed with the oil of exorcism, and they were led into the water by a deacon. The deacon washed them three times, then demanded from each one a threefold verbal confession in response to, to three direct questions about their faith in God. They were then led out of the water, anointed with the oil of thanksgiving, dried and clothed. Then a bishop would lay hands on them and pray, and he would anoint them on their forehead, making the sign of the cross. Then they were permitted to celebrate their first Lord's Supper. Right away, just regulation upon regulation. Um, uh, man, in his, in, in, with his insatiable desire to in, invent and introduce new uh, doctrines and new heresies uh, into the body of Christ and, and new functions and new rituals and new rites, you know, that, that uh, at least on the surface appeared to make a person look more holy, uh, acceptable to God, uh, everything went south. It violated the very true nature of the gospel, which is, uh, as if you follow this channel, uh, you've heard me talk a lot about the purity of the gospel, that nothing to be added, that Christ's work was, uh, was completely, totally sufficient, uh, uh, whereas paganism, uh, the difference between paganism and Christianity is what sets Christianity apart is we don't, we're not out to try to appease some angry God by what we do to make ourselves more acceptable to God, but that's what crept in early on in the beginning. Uh, and so now the church is uh, in a downward spiral, which continued throughout the centuries up to the present. And, uh, I myself, uh, uh, being uh, very interested, I've always been interested in church history. This has uh, caused some great concern on my part. Uh, I, I, I need to point out that God was in control, has been all throughout the centuries. The church itself is a living organism. It is not a brick and mortar building. God knows those who are His. The church in its purest, form, uh, the definition of the church, everything is fine. Uh, God is working in the lives of his people. He knows what he's doing all down through history. He's allowed all of these things to occur, but it doesn't make them right. And uh, in the fourth century, uh, there was great persecution inflicted upon Christians. Uh, Constantine, he, uh, he had a vision by which he was compelled to make Christianity the state religion. So we had to, we had to bring politics into it. And there were those during that period that denied the deity of Christ. Uh, they had different councils. The, the, the Nicene Council in 325 established various creeds along with their declaration of the canon. Uh, Also in that century uh, came the establishment of the clerical celibacy, the, 
uh, the celebration of Lent, Palm Sunday, Easter, Pentecost, uh, December 25th, uh, uh, from an ancient religion celebration time of the birth of the unconquered sun, S-U-N. Um, they housed these baptismal candidates who were traditionally kept ignorant of their faith and rituals during this initi initiating process. And the practice of expounding upon the scriptures was greatly expanded to include lengthy explanations rather than just reading the scriptures. So we've really got preaching coming into this now. Uh, there was a d distinct elevation of the Virgin Mary, uh, like that of the Virgin cults, and, uh, and by this time, designated worship buildings were, were quite prevalent. In the fifth century, the most significant doctrinal challenge came uh, from the uh, Pelagianists, who claimed that Adam's sin was not imputed that man was not totally depraved, he was just merely sick, and he had the ability to respond, uh, that the flesh did profit something, that we weren't quite just spiritually dead, that it, it was a cooperative activity between us and God, uh, synergism, uh, that synergism crept in. Uh, in the sixth century, uh, Gregory the Great was responsible for encouraging the doctrinal belief in a necessary purgation uh, for sins after baptism. Uh, that takes us up to the Middle Ages, uh, seventh, uh, from the seventh to the 10th century. Uh, we're talking about the Dark Ages. Uh, little is known of the church as well as mankind. We do know that this period saw a tremendous elevation in the authority of the papacy all attempts at reform were solidly squelched. Uh, it was during this period that the Church of England broke away from the Church of Rome. Going on to the 11th to the 13th century, this is the period of the Crusades. Uh, these constituted the effort of Christendom to regain the Holy Land from the Mohammedans. The 13th century uh, brought with it uh, the Inquisition. This included the punishment of heretics and the confiscation of property of those who were disapproved by the Catholic Church. And it was during this period that Thomas Aquinas elevated uh, natural reason and experiences. And uh, as I pointed out, you go down through these centuries and you see it's just a downward spiral downward spiral. The Inquisition it was a judicial procedure and a group of institutions within the Catholic Church. Their, their purpose, their aim was to combat heresy, conducting trials of suspected heretics, and study of the records have found that the overwhelming majority of sentences consisted of, you know, paying a fine, uh, but convictions of unrepentant heresy were handed over to the secular courts, which generally resulted in execution or life imprisonment. By the time we arrive at the 14th century, the, the period saw a revival of mysticism and their superstitions. There was also considerable unrest in the Catholic Church due to the, uh, the, uh, the papacy and the great... Uh, Great Schism, uh, at that time there were actually three popes. You know, they, they couldn't make up their mind who was really pope. You know, so they had two and then they had three. So you had three guys competing as pope. In, 15th, uh, in the 15th century, the Reformation began to, to take shape in this period. You owe your faith, in a sense, uh, to the Reformation. Uh, John uh, uh, Wycliffe, he questioned the authority of the Pope. Uh, as you know, you know, Martin Luther was involved in this. He, they spoke out against these indulgences. And uh, in the 16th century, it, there, were, there were more changes in the church than it, at any time since Christ founded the church. Uh, during the the preceding 1,500 years, there, there had gradually developed an unbelievable perversion 
of the mission of the church and an unprecedented corruption of the papacy and, and other church leaders uh, as, as the Catholic Church had dominated Christianity for, for over a thousand years. And it was at that time the Reformation made its move. Martin Luther boldly stood his ground. He rebelled against the Catholic Church. He elevated grace. He spoke out against indulgences. He also insisted that the wine served at the Lord's Supper was literal uh, blood. Uh, Anabaptists rebelled against infant baptism. And, uh, there was another reformer, John Calvin, he elevated faith, he elevated grace, predestination, and God himself, but he disagreed with Luther by insisting that the wine served at the Lord's Supper was only symbolic. Uh, at the same time, Catholicism was elevating confession. Arminianism uh, taught predestination and the, and the importance of individual human merit, and the Puritans and the Separatists sought purification of the church, uh, elevated the Bible above the church, and questioned the inclusion of church and state. They also sought to rid the church of Roman superstition, which had run rampant for centuries as, as carryovers from ancient pagan religions. They wanted to rid the church of the prescribed clerical dress of the Catholic leaders based on the grounds of the priesthood of the believer. They also wanted to get rid of the mandatory kneeling at the Lord's Supper, the wedding ring at marriages, and the sign of the cross at baptism. The Presbyterians and Calvinists developed into strong bodies of believers with tightly organized church leaders. And it was also during this time that the Mennonites evolved from the Anabaptist groups. In the 17th century, uh, the General Baptists evolved from the Puritans. The, Calvinist, uh, the Calvinistic Baptists emphasized baptism by immersion. The Quakers stressed the importance of the inner man, labeling the outward man as unnecessary and misleading. They wanted to rid their church of artificial titles. They were anti-war, anti-slavery. They were strong on morality. Many of these groups began a mass migration to America. In the 18th century, John Wesley had more impact on the 18th century church than any other single man. He emphasized the simplicity of the gospel, preaching over 40,000 sermons in his traveling uh, crusades. He's, he's responsible for setting up separate Bible classes, each with their own teacher as we know them today. He also shared, uh, or he started the trends of collecting a penny per week from members uh, establishing uh, membership tickets, superintendents, uh, and evangelical circuits. He, he preached perfection and morality, but not predestination. Uh, there was autonomy among the churches, and during this period, the Episcopalians broke away from the Church of England. That takes us up to the 19th century, where Charles Finney, I've done videos on this man, a good and godly man, but nevertheless used by, though he was used by God, uh, he, he popularized Presbyterian evangelism. There was widespread recognition of women workers in the church, uh, emphasis on the youth. The Christian Science Church was started, and various emphasis was placed upon health and healing. In the 1830s, Joseph Smith started the Mormon Church, which stresses faith in one's works a sinless life, water baptism, the laying on of hands, and Masonic rituals. That brings us to the 20th century. The Pentecostals have been in the spotlight in the 20th century. Uh, they emphasize speaking in tongues, a second blessing, a third blessing, and a final blessing. Uh, they distinguish between salvation and sanctification by preaching a baptism of the Holy Spirit after salvation by which one can achieve perfection. There is no such baptism. One faith, one spirit, one baptism. The 1900s saw the growth of a social gospel, stressing social concerns and missions. In 1914, the Assembly of God Church was formed. Uh, 
and the revival of the gift of tongues, the Church of God in Christ was formed uh, in 1920. Uh, there began a ecumenical reunion through the formation of the Na National Council of Churches and the World Council of Churches. In the 1960s, the Neo-Pentecostal movement began and it continues to draw charismatics from the old line denominations, including Episcopalians, Lutherans, Methodists, Presbyterians, Roman Catholics, and, and Baptist churches. And that's pretty much where we're at today. Now, I hope that that did not sound too confusing. If I could somehow summarize that whole period, this, that whole, the history of the church, what I would su suggest to you, and this has been a, a matter of interest uh, for me, you know, for just about every year that I've been alive as a Christian, I've always been fascinated somewhat by church history for obvious reasons, much more than my own family genealogy or my family tree. If I could just sort of sum all that up, I would say that the church began on the, it got off on the right foot, but immediately man-centered ideas, ideas of, of which focused more on what man had to be involved in than what, than what God had done. We, we moved away from that to where that today, in, at least in the minds of most Christians today, which whom I, I would suggest are completely, totally oblivious, totally unaware of their history, that we are involved today in activities which are far removed from where the church began. To me, it is a, a marker in a sense, it shows that we, we have digressed to a point of near apostasy in the true gospel, the purity of the gospel, and what Christ did for us, which is the message that we proclaim. And where that all the emphasis today, our enemy, Satan, has succeeded in a very real sense to to bring Christianity, Christendom, uh, to its knees in the wrong way. Uh, if you've been a follower of this channel, you know where we stand on the purity of the gospel. You would be hard pressed to find a church that preaches the purity of the gospel as it was preached as like we're seeing in our survey as we go through Acts. Not one invitation was given. There was nothing about baptism as far as that being necessary, a requirement to be redeemed, to, be, to, go, to go to heaven. Um, there was nothing ritualistic about this little band of followers that our Lord had chosen. You know, election, one of the grandest themes of the gospel is just pretty much today just been sort of tossed aside, thrown out, predestination, election, you know, all that, all that sort of thing. Uh, now we have, I have uh, done, I believe I have, I've done a verse-by-verse -verse study, it's in our playlist, of... Uh, various epistles in the New Testament which seem to confirm what I'm telling you about the gospel, but I don't think we've gone verse by verse through Galatians, which uh, I believe is, is, if the Lord tarries, that's ahead of us in, our, in the future uh, videos of BHF, but I, I want to just run you through the last, the final chapter of Galatians, Galatians chapter 6, real quick. Uh, which begins with, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, 
Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. And okay, Steve, I know what that means. That means that <clears throat> we've got to be careful. You know, we go into the bar and we, we've got a friend there and we want to get him out of the bar and we want to get him in church. So we're going to go in there and we're going to talk to him, but we've got to be really careful that he doesn't talk us into sitting there and drinking a beer with him. And that's what that means. Consider, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. He's, he's overtaken in a fault. That's drinking. Okay. Ye which are spiritual, that is, you don't drink, restore such a one. In a spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. I'm going to suggest to you that primarily, I believe the, the text is speaking of doctrine, a doctrinal fault, a doctrinal trespass. It's our brother or our sister who's living under law and we who are not, that would make us spiritual, at least in our experience, in our condition, we're to restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, that is love, and genuine concern for this individual considering ourselves lest we also be tempted. Tempted to what? Well, just to cut it right down to the bone, I'm going to suggest what, that, what that's saying is, is it's sort of akin to we see our brother who's walking down the wrong path. He's living under law. We don't want him to live under law. We want him to experience and enjoy the, the blessings of grace. And so we, we minister to this brother in such a way that in which we're so inclined, we are so driven, we are so desirous of getting him out of that the trap of legalism that we become the very thing that we're preaching against. It's often been said that we can't I can't, here's what I cannot do, folks. I can't put you under law to get you under grace. Now, the, the temptation is at that moment is overwhelming to try to beat some sense into this guy. And we'll, and we'll say and do almost anything because we, we care about it. We love him. But if, if, we're, if we're trying to get him under grace, it makes no sense what, whatsoever to take the, this, adopt the same attitude that got him into that mess in the first place. We're to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. If a man think himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. That's verse 3. For if a man think himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. Well, Steve, I know what that means. What that means is there's that, that's saying that there's some people who are something, and then there's some people who are not something. And if we're not something, we shouldn't pretend that we are something. That's what that's saying. That's, that's what that's saying. I don't believe that's what that's saying. If a man think himself to be something when he's nothing, I don't think that any of us folks are something. I think the text, the verse, is telling us that we, and don't, please don't misunderstand me, we have great value to God. But in the context of this discussion between law and grace, in, in all reality, we are vessels of mercy. We are, we don't, we're not, it's not like, well, I'm so, I'm really something and you're not. Or vice versa. If a man thinks, think himself to be something when he is nothing, that's all, that's all of us. He deceives himself. But let every man prove his own work. That's not law work. That's the works that we walk in, the works of Jesus Christ. And then shall he have rejoicing in, in, in himself alone and not in another. 
This is how this brother that we're preaching to, that we want, we want him under grace. We don't want him to continue living under law. That mindset of living under law does that very, just that very thing. It, uh, we rejoice in, 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 in one another's, we boast in, in ourselves and we boast in one another's works. And For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teaches in all good things. I don't think that's talking about money. I don't, uh, offerings, donations. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. And here's where we, we come into the picture of sowing a seed. Now when we sow a seed, folks, you know as well as I do that we have to be patient, that we can't expect a harvest the next day. It takes time. God causes the growth. There is going to be a harvest. We do sow what we reap. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that sows to his flesh, that's law, shall of the flesh, the flesh reap corruption. But he that sows to the Spirit, that's grace, shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And Steve, see, that's talking about Steve, that's talking about heaven. No, it's not. Life everlasting. Folks, if you haven't learned yet that this word life is, first of all, is zoe. It means the quality of life. Everlasting life of the, the most, the greatest quality. I mean, it is, it is what we have now. We try to understand something. If you haven't come to realize this yet, eternal life is not something that you're going to have someday. Eternal life is something that you have now. I don't believe that this is talking about a reward down the road, strictly speaking. I, I think it includes that, but I, I also believe that we reap what we sow today. And let, it, let us not be weary in well-doing. Well, Here's what I'm absolutely convinced of. I'm absolutely convinced that we can become weary in well-doing, otherwise God would not have, have, have written that for us here. Why would we become weary of well-doing? Because we're carrying a yoke that God never intended for us to bear. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the, Christ, the cross of Christ. I don't know if I could adequately express my thoughts on that verse. Circumcision is law. If you want me to be circumcised, if you want me to be circumcised, well, first of all, I'm, you know, you got to understand that we're, we're, we're talking about in the, in scripture that the whole reality of circumcision was, was to identify as a Jew. It was how, how you were identified as a Jew. It was a mark of identification. Don't try to identify me in the wrong way. Uh, circumcision. It's if you're if you're opposed to grace and you're really insistent upon that the Christian life, if you demand, I, I, I believe that the Christian life is all about law, not grace. Then, and you're trying to convince me of that. You're, con, you're trying to persuade me to be circumcised. 
Why? So that you can glory in my flesh. You don't want to be persecuted for the cross of Christ. Because the, the cross of Christ, I'm not sure... I'm not sure just how, how, how much Christians understand just what occurred at Calvary. What death, the death of Christ, provided for you and me. God forbid I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world, that is the world that would put you to death thinking it's doing God's service, the world is crucified, unto me and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. This is the rule that we walk in by and that we live by. We have been made a new creation in Christ. God has imputed His, His own righteousness to you. If you are a believer in Christ, you stand before God holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. That's how you started your life as a Christian. Just like our history started on that basis. And then as the centuries passed by, it just spiraled out of control. It was a downward, not a progression, a digression, back to the very thing that, that Christ came to deliver us from. As many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. You are not going to find peace in trying to satisfy God by means of the flesh. It's just not going to happen. The only peace and rest that you're going to find as a weary, defeated Christian is through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the cross of Jesus Christ, through the work of Jesus Christ on your behalf. You need to understand Christians have a serious lack of understanding today of just what Christ did on their behalf. And if they knew, you'd probably have to scrape them off the ceiling. They would be so excited. They'd have such peace. The chapter ends with, Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Well, I hope this at least sparks your interest in a further study of church history to see how that over the centuries it basically reflects in, a, in an overall sense as far as Christendom is concerned and the track record that it's left. It, it really in a very real, real way it reflects the very individual's personal life and walk with Christ, in, in which direction that they're going to go. Are they going to contend earnestly for the faith that was once delivered unto them, or are they not? I love you all. I truly do. Let's close again with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank You so much for Your Word that enlightens us. Shine light in our hearts. Take and heal all of the wounds, the open sore wounds of all the spiritual abuse teach us lord how to to build on you to focus on you not on things below not not ourselves but to bring glory unto you that we'd grow in grace and knowledge of you for it's in christ's name i pray amen this is steve join us on sunday in our as we continue our survey through acts i love you all I truly do. Rest in Him. Until then, thanks for watching.